Hey everyone, thank you so much for watching our online teen Bible study tonight. I'm really excited about tonight because we're starting a brand new series entitled, But God. Uh, for the next several weeks, we're going to be looking at But God moments in the Bible where that phrase, but God, appears in Scripture. It appears around 46 times in our English Bible. And every time it appears, it's a little different in its context and its meaning and its application for us. But it's an important phrase to look at. Tonight is part one of our series. And tonight we're going to look at probably the one of the most famous or one of the most well-known but God moments in all of the Bible. It's in the book of Ephesians. But before we even get there, I just want to give you a little introduction to this series. We're not going to have time to look at all 46 uh, but God moments in the Bible, but we're going to highlight several of them. Maybe for a, a, an evening, we'll look at several of them in a row in one study. Before we even look at that phrase, though, let's talk about the words, but God. They're contrasting in nature. The word but is a contrasting conjunction, and we're looking at that contrast, contrasting conjunction paired with God. This phrase, what it does is, whenever you see this phrase, it interjects into the passage of Scripture the very intervention of God. God is intervening when you see the words, but God. Often the direction of a passage of Scripture is headed in a negative way. It's often a negative situation where there seems to be no hope in sight, no positive outcome outcome can possibly result from it. No way this scenario can turn around for the good. This is just a terrible predicament. And then all of a sudden, but God. God often has to show us who we were and who we are. We're incapable, we're inept, we're inadequate uh, to meet the standard, unable to take on the situation head on, inadequate to face life circumstances. And when we realize that, but God. God intervenes on our behalf. I remember a time when I was in junior high. I did a lot of dumb things when I was in junior high. And one of those dumb things was often getting into fights. Um, usually they didn't end up in fist fights, but they usually were a fight of words and comebacks and making fun of people. And we were getting verbal fights. I remember one time I was coming back from a junior high basketball practice and we were in the back of the bus, all the guys were back there. And I remember I was starting to pick a fight with this guy or maybe he was picking a fight with me. I don't really remember all the details, but I know that we were just going back and forth and I didn't think it was ever gonna escalate into an actual fist fight because I was a scraggly little skinny Indian kid and I couldn't really hold my own. I would get beat up, all right? And so I thought it wasn't gonna go much, but this guy got so mad that he wanted to actually physically fight me. And then inside, I was getting scared because I was talking a big talk, but I knew that I couldn't hold my own in an actual fist fight. And I was getting really scared on the inside. And remember that eventually the kid pushed me down. And I was almost as if it was slow motion. I remember the kid, his hand was above his head and I was laying there on that seat. I knew that fist was coming right from my jaw or right from my face. And then all of a sudden, like it was slow motion, all of a sudden the hand of someone reached the shoulder of the guy who was about to punch me and pulled him back. It was the assistant coach. I remember I was pushed down. I remember I knew that it was going to end in a very terrible situation. I was going to get hurt. And all of a sudden, that hand of that assistant coach intervened. It came down on the shoulder of that bully. He probably wasn't a bully. I was probably the bully in that situation. But on the, on the hand of that kid who was about to punch me, and he pulled that kid back. The situation for me was very hopeless. It was very bleak. I knew that there was no good outcomes in that situation. But coach intervened. There was relief after that. There was a sense of peace. There was a sense of comfort knowing that things were going to be okay. But how much greater is it, not when a coach intervenes, but when God intervenes into our life? The truth of the matter is, guys, you will face problems and predicaments and situations that are far greater than just getting beat up. Now, getting beat up is no fun. That's, doesn't, that's not a good situation. But I know teens who would take a punch in the face if it meant that mom and dad wouldn't get a divorce. I know people that would rather get beat up physically than go through the family problems or the social problems, the, the, the circumstances that, are, that they're currently going through right now. 
you're a teenager and you're just starting out really in life and, and you think that you have some problems now, but guess what guys, there's coming greater problems in your life and, 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 and what are you going to do? You're going to, you're going to feel hopeless. You're going to feel like there's no way out. That's when it's important to remember, but God, the, but God moments. But God has intervened in our life. God is intervening in our life. God will intervene in our life. But we need to understand what scripture says on how God intervenes, why God intervenes, and when he intervenes. Sometimes God is intervening in our life and we don't even know that we're having a but God moment. We don't even know that we can claim a but God moment directly from scripture but we can. And so it's important to remember what the Bible says about these but God moments. By way of introduction, there are a number of reasons why God intervenes. But God moments can happen for our protection. They can happen for our protection. Jacob in the Old Testament, the book of Genesis, is telling Leah and Rachel about his father-in-law and about his, about how his father-in-law has treated him very badly. He says in Genesis 31 verse number 7, And your father hath deceived me and changed my wages ten times, but God suffered him not to hurt me. Jacob is, is telling Rachel and Leah, listen, I was in a bad situation, but God intervened and protected me. When we get to heaven, we're, we'll realize all the but God moments that we have every single day when God was protecting us and keeping us safe. But God moments happen for our protection. But God moments happen for our future prosperity. Joseph, if you remember, was sold into slavery. And instead of blaming it on God or chalking it up to how oftentimes we do as this is just what life threw me or this is just what life has in store for me, Joseph didn't do any of that. His own brother sold him into slavery, but he didn't even blame his own brothers. He realized it was a but God moment. He says to his brothers who sold him into slavery in Genesis 45 verses 7 and 8, but God sent me before you to preserve you a posterity in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So now it was not you that sent me hither, but God. And he hath made me a father to Pharaoh and Lord of all his house and ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. I don't think you'll ever go through a situation where it's as bad as what Joseph went through, being sold into slavery, then being thrown into prison, having all these bad things happen to him. But I know that some of us, when we go through hard situations and, and problems of life, it seems like there's no hope, just like how Joseph maybe felt. But our prerogative, our duty is to trust in the Lord because maybe, maybe it's a but God moment that you'll look back on uh, years in the future and you'll look back on those moments where you thought, man, why did that happen? You'll realize God allowed that to happen for our future prosperity. That's what Joseph realized for a future deliverance. But God moments also happen as reminders of his presence. Uh, Israel, Jacob is about to die in the book of Genesis. And God has promised the people of Israel, his children, that one day they'll be able to go back to the promised land. What they don't know is there's a bunch of years of slavery ahead of them, but they do have this promise from God that they'll be delivered and will be taken back to the promised land. And maybe the sons of Jacob and Joseph thought that as, about, as Jacob is about to die, the promise of God is about to die along with Jacob. But Jacob reminds his son Joseph in the, with these words, And Israel said to Joseph, Behold, I die, but God shall be with you and bring you again unto the land of your fathers. But God moments are often reminders of his presence to us. God will never leave us nor forsake us. No matter how bleak the situation may be, no matter how hopeless you may feel, but God. The Bible is full of those but God moments and each one teaches us a different lesson. We haven't even got out of the book of Genesis yet. We've, also, we've already seen three situations that God intervenes in, but God intervenes in those situations. Tonight, it's not just an introduction to this series, but we want to look at one of the most important but God moments in all of the Bible. It's found in the book of Ephesians chapter number two. This is really the starting point to all the other but God moments. The, all the other but God passages, this is the beginning of it all. 
We're going to break down the first six verses of Ephesians chapter number two into two sections. I want you to follow along as I read the first three verses of Ephesians chapter number two. Scripture says, and you hath he quickened. That word quickened means made alive. Who were dead in trespasses. The word trespasses means a deviation from the truth, a deviation from that which is right. And you hath he quickened, made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins. Wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. Paul is writing the book of Ephesians to the Ephesian church, the church in Ephesus, and he reminds them who they were before but God. God declares us in these first three verses spiritually dead on the basis of our trespasses and our sins, that which we've done, that which is wrong. And there's only one who can raise the dead but God. Do you know why it's important from this passage of scripture to understand our past? Because our past before Christ, before but God, because understanding who we were magnifies who we are today by His grace and will allow our expressions of gratitude and our expressions of service to be reflected accurately. If we have an inaccurate view on the other hand, or a trivial view of who we were before we were saved, before we trusted in Christ, our lifestyle and our expression will also reflect that. And so the first three verses gives us our past diagnosis, our past diagnosis, who we were before but God. And so verse number one tells us that we were dead and we were spiritually dead because of our trespasses, our deviation from the truth and our sins. Verse number two builds on the status of being dead in sins. He says in verse number two, we're in time past, ye walked. That word walked has the idea of walking back and forth, but going nowhere. Walked according to the course of this world, according to the pattern of this world, according to what this world uh, craves and what this world pushes forth, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience. This verse tells us before our but God moment when we trusted in Christ, our walk, our direction in life was the same as the world's. We craved what the world had to offer. Guys, this world is no friend of the believer. This world is no friend to you. The world offers temporary trinkets of momentary happiness, but never true lasting joy. Only God offers that. Only Jesus offers that. We were consumed with what the world had to offer, however, before but God. Then he says, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. The world and Satan have long held hands. In tandem, they're the enemy of God. In tandem, they're the enemy of the believer. They're your enemy today. But they're the best friend of the dead sinner. Hey, before you trusted in Jesus Christ as your Lord and personal Savior, you were best friends with the world. You were best friends with Satan. They worked together as a team and you walked according to to the course of this world. And the Bible says, you were also by nature the children of wrath, even as others. Let's back up and read the full verse, verse number three. Among whom, he says, among whom, that scripture saying this, you were in that crowd. Among whom, we also had our conversation. The word conversation means a lifestyle, your lifestyle. In times past, in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. The passage of scripture, verse number two, and verse number three says this, we walked in tandem with the world, we walked in tandem with Satan, we live for the purposes of Satan, and then he says, our desires, what we longed for, what we craved, was the desires of the flesh and of the mind. You know, you were walking hand in hand with the world and Satan before trusting in Christ. Well, verse three says, because the very craving of a dead sinner is the lust and, and, and lust and longing of the flesh and mind. Someone once said this, only when we come to the end of who we really are, then only can we see God for who He really is. 
Only when we come to the end of who we really are can we see God for who He really is. You know what verses 1 through 3 are showing us? It's showing us who we really were before but God. We walked according to the course of this world. We were holding hands with Satan. We were holding hands with the world. We craved what our flesh wanted, sinful desires. But the next two verses recall our present deliverance. Our present deliverance. Look at verse number four. The Bible says, but God. Here it is, guys. Here's the but God moment. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us. In other words, has made us alive. This references back to verse number one, when he says that we were not alive, we were dead. Hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace ye are saved. And hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Here is the but God moment in this passage. But God raises the dead, the spiritually dead. Often, the situation is bleak. Our situation before we got saved was bleak. Our situation was hopeless. Our eternal destiny was secured, not in heaven, but in a place called hell. Because of our sins and because of our trespasses, we were settled or we were sold into the slave market of Satan. But then all of a sudden, the two most hopeful words in all of Scripture come on the scene. But God, but God. We had our purposes aligned with the world, but God. We had our, our, our way aligned with what Satan wanted, but God. We had a path that we walked that pleased ourselves, which would undoubtedly lead to destruction, but God. He is rich in mercy, this verse says. I'm thankful that while God owns everything, He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. His richness is not measured in gold or silver or money. It's measured in the amount of mercy that He offers to you and for me. His great love, this verse says, no mind on earth can comprehend the breadth and height and depth of God's love to send His Son to die on the cross for our sins. These attributes modify the character of God, but here's the action of God. The Bible says He hath quickened us. He hath made us alive together with Christ. But God made us alive who were once dead. Imagine you had a bad heart condition. I know that you're you're probably a teenager and you don't have many health problems right now. But imagine that you had a heart condition where you needed a heart transplant, but there was no one available to give you a heart transplant, and it was moments before you were to step into eternity and die. It was moments before you took your last breath on this earth, and there was very little hope that you would get a heart for a heart transplant. But then your best friend, stepped up because there was no one available and it was just moments before you were to die and gave their life so that you could have their heart so that you could continue living but it meant that your friend would have to die so you had no choice in the matter you woke up from surgery and all of a sudden you realized that you had your heart the heart that you had was your best friend's and he sacrificed his life so that you could have a heart you were about to die but now you're made alive by the sacrifice of your friend but guys how much greater a sacrifice God who looked at you who were already dead and made you alive to the sacrifice of his son but God What amazing words those two words are. And so in these verses, you find your present deliverance, but you also see this promising declaration about who God is. So often we focus on the attributes of God, about God saving man, about God being a gracious God, about God being a merciful God, about God being a a loving God, and all those attributes are important to understand the character of God. But for a few minutes tonight, focus rather than on the saving attributes of God, all that's important, focus on God himself for a minute. This promising declaration is this God who is loving and merciful and gracious, this God made you alive. This God saves sinners. This God extends grace. This God quickened me. And teenagers, this is the starting point to all the other but God moments in Scripture. 
This is a starting point to all the but God moments in Scripture. Tonight, I want you to take a moment, take a few minutes to reflect and meditate on who you were, our past diagnosis. That will give you a greater sense of gratitude for your present deliverance, that God has saved you, that God has rescued you. And then you can declare with promise, but God made me alive. I was dead but now I'm alive. Guys, I'm so excited for this series because this series is one of probably the most encouraging things that I've studied. How when the situation seems like there's no hope in sight, when there's no light at the end of the tunnel, but God intervenes. But all those other but God moments will not mean anything unless you have come to realize that this but God moment is the starting point. Have you trusted in Christ as your Savior? Hey, do you realize who you are, a sinner? Have you put your faith and trust in what Jesus Christ did on the cross? Do you know that your sins are washed away? Do you know that you have a home in heaven? Have you had the but God moment that turns you from a sinner to a saint, that turns you from a wretched man to a blessed individual, one that knows his destiny is secured in heaven and not hell? Have you had your eternal but God moment are you saved? Have you trusted in Christ? If you haven't, I want to encourage you to reach out to me, reach out to us so that we can show you how you can have your eternal but God moment, how you can know that you're on your way to heaven. For the rest of you that are watching that have already had that moment, that have already trusted in Christ, I hope that you'll take time to reflect on what this moment means for you. Remember who you were, not to revel in your past, but to remember what you have in Christ and to look towards your future and how you can live for God. I trust this message was an encouragement to you. We'll be back next week with part two on Thursday night of our But God series. Have a great night.